At about 30 minutes yesterday afternoon, the front desk called and said someone dropped off a, a little gift uh, basket for you. I said, uh, you want us to bring it up or hold it? I said, I'll come down and get it. And I went down there and it's laundry basket. It's a laundry basket. Is it that deep? It's that wide? Four. I mean, full of stuff. I mean, everything under the sun looked like somebody robbed Walmart. Or something. <laughs> but my wife has to remind me I don't have to eat all that at one time. <laughs> but thank you so much. Very, very thoughtful. And we appreciate it so very much. Acts chapter 12. Ladies, thank you for the delicious, delicious meal. Uh, that's uh, no better place to eat than where Baptist women are cooking. Amen. I tell you, it's the best food in the world. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate it very much. Acts chapter 12, we're going to read here about 17 verses, and uh, then we'll let you, we'll pray, and then we'll let you sit down and uh, give you some thought from our heart today. Acts chapter 12, verse 1, now about that time, Herod, the king, stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then with the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals, and so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. Kind of like waking up a teenager, you know, you got to tell them to do everything, get dressed and all that. Verse 9. <laughs> and he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but he thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. Now, how many, let's stop right here a minute and ask yourself, how many of you believe this really took place? It really did. Just like it said it does. Amen. Very interesting. Verse 11. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, again, we're thankful that for the morning. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful lunch and all the work and labor that went into this. And Lord, for the wonderful time of fellowship. And Lord, we thank you again for your precious word. Thank you for the Son of God who died and gave his life and shed his blood that we could be saved. And Lord, we thank you for this time of uh, searching our hearts and seeking you, Lord, for revival. 
that you do a work amongst us now. We ask now, bless your words that goes forth now in these next few moments. Lord, please, again, I ask Holy Spirit of God, take, uh, Lord, just uh, take your word and do with it what only you can do in our lives. Lord, empower us and direct us, please. We pray and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, you can be seated. Interesting story in a lot of different ways. Uh, I want to I want to take our thought from a statement uh, in verse eleven. Uh, this for the next little bit it will not be very long this afternoon, but I, I want us to think about something here. As we go forward this week. Verse eleven said, "When Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know for surety that the Lord hath sent His angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews." I want us to think about that word expectation for a moment. The Bible said that, that what God did with Peter in this situation uh, was not what the Jews expected to happen. And so I want us to think for a few minutes about expectations. We're going to look for a moment at Herod's expectation in this situation and then the Jews' expectation and even Peter's expectation. But what I'm really interested in is what the church's expectations were in this book, in this passage, and apply that to what are our expectations uh, of these next few days of meetings. Uh, here's a church that's been praying and have been seeking God's face. They've been asking to God to do something and answer to prayer in a situation that is not good in a society that is against God and, or against the gospel and against Jesus Christ and a government that uh, is wielding its power against the people of God and of course the religious system uh, that is rejecting the message of the, the gospel of the grace of God and salvation through a man called Jesus Christ. All these things are going on and the Bible says very clearly the people of God are meeting together and have been praying for God to do something but what were their expectations of God? As we think about that and think about this week, uh, and I know many of you have been praying, the church been praying for this meeting. We've been praying God to do something in the midst of a time when we live in a very uh, anti-gospel, anti-Bible, anti-church society. Amen. We live in a society today when, when our government is not on the side of God's people anymore. And uh, we're living in a time, of course, of religious, still religious persecution in many ways. Uh, but what are, what are your expectations of this coming week? What are you expecting God to do with you? Ever think about that? Well, let's look here. I want you to see Herod's expectations. First of all, verses 1 through 3. Herod here, he's stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. He kills James, the brother of John, with the sword. Because it saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Now, Herod's expectation in this whole situation is, is he's expecting to kill Peter. And I would say he's planning on killing him the very next day uh, after this event takes place. That's his expectations. I'm glad God is greater uh, than the expectations of the higher powers that we live in today. Yeah. I'm glad that our God is greater uh, than our government. Ain't you, aren't you? I'm glad he's greater than the religious system of this world. I'm glad he's greater than the spirit of Antichrist, which is prevalent in this world. I'm glad he's greater than all that because he is greater. And no matter what they are expecting to take place and what their expectations are, how they're going to rule us and rule the world and do whatever they're doing in this country and across the world, my friend, God's greater. He's got it all under control this morning. It's all under control. So let's see a little bit of Herod's expectations and then God spoiled them. Then I see the Jews' expectations, verse 3, and because he saw it please the Jews. The Jews are talking about those who uh, are rejecting the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, those who are still defending, staying under the law, and uh, the, the gospel of Christ was an offense to that, and uh, they're persecuting the Christians. They, they stoned Stephen to death. And uh, we see that they're, they're against the, the religious system. And that this religious system of work salvation today is still against the gospel. And by the way, it's not the gospel. Uh, work salvation, we talked about Zambia a little while ago. Uh, we were talking about how wonderful it was to go to Zambia. And you could literally stand on the street corner in Zambia 24 hours a day 
never run out of somebody to talk to verbally in English about the word of God. They will come to you. They will beg you to stay. I had a man that approached me on the sidewalk first evening we were in Lusaka, the capital city. We were on the sidewalk pass, trying to pass out John and Romans and pamphlets about uh, work salvation versus salvation by grace. And uh, he had gotten one of those and he came up to me with another man and he began talking to me. And he was a, he was a pastor of about 200 people. Pastoring of people, 200 people. He was, he was very confused. His name was Moses, by the way. His name was Moses, and very intelligent man. You could tell, probably 35, 40 years old. And we began to engage there, and he said, he read that pamphlet that the missionary had written up addressing this situation, and he said, I have, I have studied the word of God enough to know that salvation is not by the keeping of the law. He'd been confused with charismatics and the Seventh-day Adventists. He said, I'm convinced of that. But he said, I, I am scared to death to believe and preach that salvation is by grace through faith alone. He said, I don't understand. What a sad thing. And we conversed there for 20 minutes or so, and he had to leave. He wanted my phone number and contact information. We got back to the States, and he begged me to come back. He asked me to come and preach in his church that Sunday, Pentecostal, out, I mean, full-blown. He didn't even have a church because he tried to start one. He started a Bible study in his home for himself and his neighbors. Not called to preach, none of that. He's got 200 people coming. Wonderful. But now it's a show. It's a show. Anyway, we kept in contact. I contacted the missionary we were with. I said, look, this guy is really wanting some help. The man offered to buy my plane ticket and fly me back to Zambia to try to teach him the Bible. Contacted the missionary we was with. He set up an appointment, went to his house the next day, spent three hours with him, over three hours with him in the scriptures and led the man to the Lord. Amen. I'm telling you, uh, the, relig but the, the religious is what I'm saying is we went to Zambia, we experienced that in Zambia, but I don't care where you go in this county. You ask the average person if they're going to heaven, they'll give you the answer. If they give the answer in the affirmative, their reason will be because of their works. No different. The difference is we don't really confront them after they tell us that. We just leave them alone and go on. Uh, and they're not really hungry. They're satisfied in their religion. Zambia, they're hungry. But I'm saying the religious system of the world in the day of, of Peter and Paul uh, hated the true gospel, the, the gospel of salvation by grace through faith and, and not of ourselves. And it's still the same today. But their expectations was we're going to get rid of another mouthpiece. We got rid of Stephen. We're going to get rid of. We got rid of James. Now we're going to get rid of Peter. He's the ringleader anyway. We're going to get rid of him. Amen. So, but thank God, their expectations didn't come to fruition at that time. Amen. Verse eleven. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, "Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent His angel and delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews." I'm glad God's greater than the religious system of this world. And then I want us to notice, what in the world was the church expecting here? The Bible said, and when Peter was coming to himself in verse 11, or verse 12 rather, and when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Now that's a good thing. Here's a praying church. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And by the way, let me ask you real quick. Did God answer the prayers of God's people? He did. They're praying. I'm sure they're praying somewhere along the lines of God, please protect Peter. God, please deliver Peter. God did. He answered their prayers. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Amen? Notice, as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to heart and named Rhoda, and when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate, and they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. So I'm asking the question, what were they expecting? 
They're praying. I believe they're praying specifically. I believe they prayed effectually. I believe they play, prayed fervently, and God answered their prayer. The prayer's knocking on the door. So what were they expecting? It's a good question. It's a good question. And what I want us to think about tonight, this afternoon is, what are we expecting? I won't ask for a show of hands, but how many of you have been praying for this meeting? Amen? What are you expecting to happen? Amen? Now, I hope you're not expecting us to walk the pews. That's probably not going to happen. I'm not going to swing from the chandeliers. That's not going to happen. I'm not going to speak in tongues, even though I do live in the South. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Uh, well, let's ask ourselves, what can we expect? Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 3. I just want to use this text to make some application, and then we'll go home. Revelation chapter 3. You know this passage of scripture, chapters 2 and chapter 3, these seven church letters, that uh, the Lord is speaking to his churches, local churches, literal churches. In verse 14, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen. That's Jesus Christ. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thy salve, and that thou mayest see... And as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Now, I read this because I want us to consider here is a local church, the Laodicean church. We all know about it. It's a lukewarm church. It makes God sick. Is that right? I mean, everything that can be wrong with this church is wrong. But it's his church. He says so. It's his. It's pathetic. How many of you would like to go out and join a church just like the Laodicean church? You could probably go down the road just a little ways and find one. But as for me personally, I have no desire to be a part of a church that fits this criteria right here. Amen. This church is in tremendous need of help from God. Amen. They don't even, they're, they're not even aware of it. They don't care. And the Lord has to rebuke them and, and, uh, and command them to repent. But the point I want to make is this. He said to this church, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The Lord Jesus is wanting to help this church. Now this church here, no way it compares to this church of the see it. But I, I want us to see how much the Lord wants to help his church church, his people, his heart for his own. As pathetic as this church is, the Lord's wanting to revive. Amen. Is that right? I don't think that's a stretch. The Lord is wanting in. He's wanting them to turn to him and let him in and change their whole situation. That's his desire. And I want us to think about this as we, as we pray about this meeting. What does the Lord, what are we expecting from the Lord? Well, I believe we can expect that our Lord wants to revive his church. He wants to revive this church. He wants to revive every single blood-bought church that he owns. Amen. He owns them all. They're his. 
It's his desire to revive his people. We don't have to say, Lord, we hope that you want to revive us. No, if we belong to him, he wants to revive us. Yeah. That's his desire. As sorry and low down as the church at Corinth was, God sent Paul to help them to get them back on track where they need to be. Amen. No matter where we're at as a church, we're praying for God to grant revival. We need to expect that God wants to. That God really wants to do something in our midst, in our lives, that would revive us spiritually. How many believe that tonight? We need to believe that. We need to expect that. Now, here's something else I noticed in this passage. The Lord Jesus Christ was where? He was at the church. Can't knock on the door if you ain't there. Amen. We can expect God to already be present. I've been in meetings where they start praying, Oh God, we pray that you show up. That's not doctrinally sound praying. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. God's already here. We, I've, heard, I've preached a lot in the South. I hear a lot of things down there. We need to go, oh God, we pray that you'll show up and show out. We might be scared to death if God really showed out sometimes. I think he did that with Ananias and Sapphira. We don't have to pray, God, would you please show up? He's here. All right. Holy Ghost of God is here. He lives in every one of us that are saved. He's here. Now, the question is, while he's here, is he going to have liberty to work in my life? Now, the truth of the matter is, he may have liberty over here to work in this person's life and not have liberty to work over here. Why? Because his liberty to work is based on our willingness to let him. Our own free will. Isn't that right? We want to make sure if we want to see the Holy Spirit of God work in our midst, it begins with me individually. I need to make sure that I, I'm not doing anything or allowing the, anything in my life to grieve the Holy Spirit. Right? Because the Holy Spirit of God can be grieved. i got to make sure that I'm not doing anything in my life to quench the Holy Spirit. I think grieving has to do with him as a person. Quenching has to do with him as his power. Quench the whole, so like putting a damp rag on, on burning fire. I don't want anything in my life to quench him and uh, cause him not to be able to exercise the power in his life that he is able to exercise. I want to make sure that I'm not doing anything to resist the Holy Spirit, no matter what the Calvinist lied to us about. You can resist the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Resistance has to do with his authority in our life, his permission in our We give him permission. And so we want to make sure uh, we, that we expect, we can expect the Holy Ghost of God, we can expect God Almighty to be here when we show up. Because he already said he would be. What we want to make sure of is that he has the liberty to work in our lives when we show up. We don't resist him, we don't quench him, we don't uh, uh, grieve him, in any way. Amen? And so I find here, according to what he's doing in Revelation 3 with this church at Laodicea, I can, I can expect God to be already present. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I came this morning. I expected God to be here and I got here. If I didn't think he's going to show up, I don't want to be here. But I knew he would be. Because it's God's people. Amen? So I knew he would be here. They expect him to want to do a work of revival. Not about me, it's about him, his desire. Then I want you to notice, this week you can expect, now here's what happened here, the Lord's doing what? You can expect, if you come with the right heart, and seeking God to do something, you can expect God to knock on your door. I mean, you believe the Lord wants to knock on your door. You say, well, that guy over there, he needs the Lord to knock on his door a long time. 
No. We need to expect God to knock on my door. Amen? I'm talking about expectation, what we've been praying about, We're praying for revival. Then we need to pray and expect God to knock on my door because guess what? I probably need revival. And he already knows. Then we can expect God to know exactly what we need. Do you believe God knows exactly what you need to? He knows exactly what I need. He knows exactly what you need and your needs are different than their needs and vice versa. But we can expect God to already know that. And I'm glad he does. You know, if you've got four children as a parent, uh, you can differentiate the needs of those different children. Amen? They've each got individual needs. You know what they are. Well, our Father, our God is a much greater parent than that. So we can expect God to knock on our door. We can expect God to address our Need And that's what he did with the lady in church. He addressed their need. Now, in addressing their need, he's pointing out some problems. Amen? We can expect God to show us what's hindering revival in our lives. That's what the truth of the Word of God does. So we can expect God to address the need. Then he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man will open the door, we can expect God to wait on a response from us. Amen? Hey, listen, it's one thing to get the truth preached to us and God convict and deal with our hearts about it, but God is waiting for a response. Just like salvation. God provided the means of salvation. God dealt with us about our need for salvation. God convicted us of our need. God granted to us the faith if we would just do what? If we will respond, then God will do the same. It's the same thing with reviving. It depends on our response. If I want personal revival, I can have it. If you want it, you can have it. If we respond to God as God addresses the need. How many of you believe that? These are things we can expect. Now listen, let me just say this and go on if I finish. Not just in a revival service, but every service. Every service where the word of God is preached. God's not going to deal and work with you about your spiritual need just through a man. He works through the word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. So it's not about who's in the pulpit. It's about the word of God deal with your heart. Then he said, now I expect this, and this is something we've almost already addressed, expect a conflict with the truth. So if he's pointing out things that I'm needing to deal with in my heart and let him deal with my heart so that I can have revival, then we better expect a conflict with where we are currently. Because of where we were supposed to, if we are where we're supposed to be currently, then we're already revived, right? But if I've got some issues that need to be addressed, and God's going to use the truth to address them, and he's waiting on a response, then I need to expect a conflict with the truth. Whatever, something in my life that is conflicting with the truth that God is giving me. So there's going to be there's going to be a conflict. There's going to be a battle. There's going to be a struggle. How many of you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah. God, do we deal with something? Convict your heart about it? And then there's that conflict. What am I going to do? Am I going to listen to God and the, and the Holy Spirit? Or am I going to listen to my flesh and my will and my desire? And then if we'll do those things and expect those things, our God is faithful. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Then we can expect to be astonished. <laughs> it says they were astonished when they finally figured out what happened, what God had done in answer to their prayers. They were astonished at what God did for them, what he did for Peter, what he did in answer to their prayer, what he did in their personal lives. And listen, I believe when, God, when, when revival comes, it is a work. It's a work of God. It is not a work of man. 
Revival truly is a work of God. But many times God is hindered in his work because of our own self-will. We're willing to agree if we'll open the door when he knocks. He said, if any man will open the door, I will come in. I got news for you. That's where revival hits right there. Amen. Amen. Listen, I don't know what you're expecting, but I think these are some things we can expect this week by faith. We can expect these things because God is God. And God wants a revived people. Amen? Let's stand. Pastor, you come. Maybe you just need to come today and say, Lord, please help my expectations to be by faith in you. Not in the meeting. Not in the circumstances we're in today. We can't have revival today. Too wicked. No, God's greater than all that.